Hey, this is Phil Diaz. I'm the pastor at Greencastle Church of the Nazarene, and this is our podcast. I want to thank you for joining us today. It's my prayer that God would use this podcast to speak to your life right where you're at. I pray it also builds your faith and helps give you perspective on how God can work, move, and transform your life. Enjoy the message. I would love to be able to welcome to you here this morning uh, our special guest all the way from Bourbonne, Illinois. This is the Olivet Preaching <coughs> Ambassador. This is John Harmon. Amen. Amen. So, John, I'm just going to turn everything over to you, okay? Awesome. Am I on? Can you all hear me? Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Well, good morning. Thank you for welcoming me. Um, I got to meet a few of you this morning. Um, I just love it here. Pastor Phil showed me around the church and um, showed me around the home. I just love it. Um, I grew up in the country, so I love the woods. So it's been great. Um, so just a little bit about me before we start, just so I'm not just some talking head up here to you guys. Um, I'm a preaching ambassador from all of that National University. It's uh, it's close to Chicago. It's like 50 minutes south of Chicago in Bourbon A, if you guys are familiar. And um, every single semester, um, each preaching ambassador is sent out a few times each semester, somewhere in the Midwest, just to preach and uh, fill the pulpit um, at uh, different churches. Um, so yeah, thank you, Pastor Phil, for having me. Uh, thank you, Green Castle, for uh, letting me preach and just giving me up this opportunity. So it's, before we start, I just want to acknowledge um, this immense responsibility that I've been given to preach um, to, from the Word of God. And I want to be clear, I don't take that lightly. And just want to assure you that um, I care about what I say. I care about speaking the truth. Um, but at the same time, I'm not the only one in this room with responsibility. Um, each one of you has been given the responsibility to examine what I say and compare it with the truth of God's Word. Um, and what I, should, what I say should not be considered the final word. Um, each of you should be propelled to seek the truth outside of the sanctuary. Um, and good preaching will always challenge you to examine yourself, to ask questions, um, and to pursue godliness. So, if you would all stand with me um, in honor of God's word, um, and direct your attention up to the screens, we're going to just read the passage for today. Uh, awesome. Here we go. And Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. And he called to him his twelve disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every disease and every affliction. The names of the twelve apostles are these. First, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, James, son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, Philip, and Bartholomew, Thomas, and Matthew, the tax collector, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, Simon, the zealot, and Jesus Iscariot, who betrayed him. The apostles returned to Jesus. Um, we're skipping uh, to Mark chapter 6, starting in verse 30. Um, this is when the, the disciples come back and out to the missionary journey. Um, the apostles returned to Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. And he said to them, Come away by yourselves to a desolate place and rest a while. For many were coming and going, and they had no leisure even to eat. And they went away to excuse me, and they went away into the boat to a desolate place by themselves. Now many saw them going and recognized them, and they ran there on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for this opportunity um, to get to gather and Lord, have fellowship um, to hear your word this morning. And Lord, I just pray that you would hide me behind the cross, Lord, that um, this morning is not about me and my um, my ability to preach, Lord. Um, so Lord, I pray that you would be speaking um, through um, through my weakness, through my flaws, that um, each person in this room would see um, Jesus and experience you this morning. Um, would you give each of us ears to hear and eyes to see uh, what you want to speak to each and every one of us. Um, and we'll thank you, Lord, for that. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. So, like any passage of Scripture, uh, we always need to understand the world we are entering. Because um, I think it's easier for us to read our 21st century American context in the Bible and forget that each passage of Scripture um, was written um, to a specific people at a specific time in history. Um, 
So just like anything else, if we don't understand a few basic questions behind a passage, we have a really high chance of misinterpreting it. So um, the, big thing, the big thing I want to point out um, is the fact that Israel was an agrarian society, which just means their whole economy was based on producing and maintaining crops and farmland. Um, and not only that, but the sacrifice at the temple um, was at the center of Jewish society. So when Jesus refers to um, Israel being lost sheep, and when he talks about a plentiful harvest and few laborers, every single person that was hearing Jesus would have known exactly what he was talking about. Okay? So how does that affect our interpretation? First of all, um, when Jesus talks about um, the people being sheep without a shepherd, um, it would have been very important because when uh, sheep didn't have a shepherd, they were vulnerable to attack. Uh, many sheep would go astray, the shepherd wasn't around. And um, a budding order would arise in the herd. What's interesting is um, when, when shepherds look um, and when shepherds talk about um, herding sheep, um, what's, what's, what's really interesting is that um, sheep don't have a budding order when the shepherd's around. But as soon as the shepherd leaves, all of a sudden there's this pecking order or budding order that arises. So without a shepherd, um, things start to fall apart pretty quickly. And second, um, when Jesus talks about the harvest being plentiful, uh, but the laborers being few, um, this also would be important um, because they didn't have huge machinery back then um, to plant and to harvest, right? So everything was based on rigorous manual labor. And on the years where the harvest was really plentiful, but they didn't have many people to harvest the crops, the farmer who owns the fields would be at risk um, um, to losing a lot of the crop. So, in light of this, um, let's just look at what's going on in this passage. Um, so first of all, Jesus says he's uh, proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom. And gospel just means good news. Uh, and the good news was that uh, the Messiah that the Jews were waiting for, um, for hundreds of years, had drawn near to them. Um, Jesus was there to fulfill the messianic prophecy that Isaiah talks about um, in Isaiah 61. Um, it reads, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim the liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound. So, part of the good news was that Jesus was doing miracles. He was setting people free. Um, he was uh, delivering people from uh, evil spirits. He was healing infirmities. Right? And um, before we, we go into the rest of the story, I just want to share a quick testimony that I think will really help us understand. Um, the rest of the passage. So, um, in February, I helped one of my professors move some pianos. Um, there was like one in his house, one in his mom's house. So we were just hauling around, me and, me and a couple of my, uh, my football buddies, I'm a football player. Um, so we uh, helped my professor move his pianos. And I got to meet my professor's father-in-law and his mother. And um, this is a really nice couple. Um, and the father-in-law loved, loves to watch our games. So, um, we talked a little bit, and he got my number. And um, so a few days after um, I was hauling those pianos for him, um, he gives me a call. He's like, hey, John, I'd love for you to come over and watch this thing called The Truth Project. And honestly, um, my initial reaction was, um, this is a man, uh, he's just lonely. He just wants friendship, he wants fellowship. And I was, I mean, as a college student, I'm super busy. I, uh, I have football practice, I got to watch film, I have school, I have relationships. But, I just felt like God wanted me to go over and minister to this old man. So I was like, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna um, take a Friday night, I'm gonna go over there, I'm gonna spend some time with him. And um, so I went over to his house that night and um, we talked and um, his wife makes some, this really good apple pie. And it was just really good. But I remember leaving there that, that night just in awe because I thought I was going over there to minister to this man and um, to love on him and to just, just, just be his friend. But, in reality, I went over there, and this man ministered to me the entire time. He was just loving on me. He was um, he was encouraging me. We watched this amazing video all about truth and how that applies in our life. And I left there, and I was just like, I went to this man's house because I thought I was going to love on him, and I was I was going to I'm speaking to his life and be his friend. But in reality, I went over there. I was just the, the complete opposite. Okay, so Jesus is, is out here, he's doing miracles, he's doing his things, and these people are following him because he's doing stuff for them, right? And honestly, um, I would do the same thing. If people were, um, if, if some guy was uh, healing my family and providing food for us, I'd follow him too, right? Um, but the problem was, these people needed uh, much more than just physical healing and physical provision. These people needed um, something more, something 
something spiritual, because these people were spiritually dead. These people needed um, something more than just food, and um, to um, something more than just physical healing, like I said. Um, and these people were blind to the reason that Jesus was actually there, right? These people needed a savior, not just from um, from hunger and, um, and disease, but they needed a savior of their souls, okay? So I mean, all the blindness, selfishness, and sin, Jesus just stops and he's like, um, the scripture says he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. And um, we can just quickly understand something that these people weren't just needy. The Bible says that they were completely helpless. And I think the connotation of this word helpless has been really watered down. So let me just quickly define it for you. This is what the dictionary defines it as. To be, com uh, to be helpless is to be completely unable to provide what you need for yourself. And here's the Here's the scary thing is none of these people knew they were helpless. Okay, only Jesus knew. Only Jesus saw through all their blindness, all their neediness. And um, all these people had no grip on reality. They were so focused on what they needed right now that they had no understanding that they actually they needed someone to save them from an eternity away from Jesus. Okay? So here's my point. On our own, we're completely helpless. We're like sheep without a shepherd. We're, we're, we're in this budding order of life where it's all about me. I'm trying to build up my brand and everyone else I want to, I want to put down. And um, just, just all the, all the evils of life that, that we all know so well, right? Um, and a lot of times on our own, um, all the time, we're completely blind to what we actually need in that situation. So just like my situation with Dave, these people were like, hey, I need, I need food. I need all this stuff. Well, Jesus actually knew what they what they needed, and Jesus recognized that um, that we needed him before um, before we were we recognized that we needed him. So, what does Jesus do? Um, he immediately calls to himself the very people who needed him. Okay, in this case, he just called twelve guys who, who we know today as the twelve disciples. And um, in the same way, Jesus sees each of us right now and is calling us to follow him. Okay, but I think. A lot of us, when, when we read that, we're like, well, those were the 12 disciples, right? They were so godly and awesome. And um, we immediately put the 12 disciples in a category separate from us. And um, in, into a different class, we tell ourselves that uh, we're not superhuman like those like those disciples were. And if Jesus called them, um, he's not calling me, right? Or um, maybe all this talk about Jesus being super compassionate sounds great, but I'm guessing that for some of you, there might be a problem. You might feel completely unworthy of Jesus because of what you've done, or even what you're doing, and um, maybe you're asking yourself, why would Jesus call someone like me? Okay, so I want to take a minute to explore what the Bible says about Jesus' closest friends. Because if Jesus called those 12 guys to cast out demons, to go out and perform miracles, then um, it's, it's, it's going to be um, big for us to compare ourselves, hey, are we even worthy of, of following Jesus? Okay, so first, uh, Peter at one point claimed that all the other disciples would betray Jesus, but that he wouldn't. Okay, but the same day he would deny Jesus three times outright. James and John at one point asked Jesus to use his heavenly power uh, to call out fire from heaven to kill a group of Samaritans they didn't like. Okay, Matthew was a tax collector. Um, he would have been hated by the Jews because of position. He probably misused his position. Um, for for greedy selfish gain, okay. Simon, called the Zealot, would have been a literal terrorist. Okay, he would have plotted ways to serve insurrection, often involving the murder of Romans and uh, pretty much anyone who who got in the, in the Zealot's way. Okay, Thomas, he doubted the testimony of all his friends. Okay, just imagine this: you spend your your entire life for three years. Okay, for three years of your life, you're spending um, an immense amount of time. With, with this group of people, and they tell you Jesus is alive, and immediately Thomas doubted, and, and he didn't believe, okay? Um, and not only that, but Jesus outright told uh, Thomas that um, he would rise from the dead, and, and Thomas still doubted. And last but not least, um, the saddest of them all is Judas Iscariot. Um, this guy had the Holy Spirit working miracles through him, and he witnessed crazy things like Jesus walking on the water, keeping the 5,000, all these things, but he still betrayed Jesus. Okay, not to mention, all of these men would have been, un or almost all of these men would have been un uneducated, and um, 
And what's worse is that in Jesus' greatest need, when Jesus was dying on the cross, um, every single one of his friends, except for John, deserted him. And um, it's just it's just sad. So compare yourself to these men for a second, okay? These men were not superhumans. These men were not um, super righteous. These men were broken, just like us. These, these men needed Jesus just as much as we do, and these men were flawed, okay? And Jesus knew that, that these men would do these things before he even called them, okay? And this has really big implications for us. So I just want to get something out of the way. I don't know most of your stories, um, but I guarantee at some point, um, someone in this room has convinced themselves that Jesus would never call someone like you because you're too sinful, you're too dirty, whatever it is. And on one hand, you're right, okay? We've all sinned previously against our Creator, and we do not deserve any chance of following Him or even having a relationship with Him. But the life changing truth, Romans 5 6 through 8, but while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. But one would scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare to even die. But God showed his love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Okay? I said it again. I've said it before, I'm going to say it again. Jesus calls broken people just like you and me to partner with them. Okay? And trust me, if Jesus called these men to follow him, he's calling us too. Okay? So, he knows everything you've done, everything you will do. But he still loved you enough to give his own life so that you might have a relationship with him. So the answer is not us trying super hard to be good and super hard to be super righteous, okay? The answer is that through faith in Jesus Christ we're saved through grace. And not anything we could ever do we could earn that love from him. Um, Jesus died to cleanse you of your sin. You just have to be humble enough to receive the gift that Jesus is offering you, okay? So let's, let's just reread really quick. The passage of the disciples' call. Um, this is this is Matthew nine and ten. The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into His harvest. And He called to Him His twelve disciples to give them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out to heal every disease and every affliction. So, what does this mean for us? Uh, it means that Jesus is calling each of us to be a laborer in the great harvest. And I think the term labor has a slightly negative connotation. Um, it sounds like hard, grueling work, and um, for love's sake, I'm, I'm just not going to sugarcoat it for you guys. Um, being a genuine Christian is not easy, okay? And um, if you want to follow Jesus, um, Jesus literally says you have to take up your cross, okay? Yes. And we, as Christians, we throw, around, we throw that phrase around all the time, take up your cross, take up your cross. What does that mean? Jesus was beaten, he had a crown of thorns in his head, and he had to carry his cross, the very cross that he was going to die on, he had nails through his hands. That, that's what it means to take up our cross. It doesn't mean I'm going to live a super comfortable life, okay? So if we want to follow Jesus, it means that we willingly lay our, down our own control and our own comfort for Jesus' sake. If your life has gotten comfortable, I want to just challenge you for a second that you are not a laborer for Jesus, okay? Not that following Jesus is this joyless, restless work, okay? In fact, we actually find joy in being a laborer for Jesus um, because we get to partner with Jesus while we do it, okay? And Jesus promises us rest, and he says that his yoke is easy and his burden is light. But don't think for a second that following Jesus will be this little addition to your life, okay? That um, you, it's, I, I don't know, this is the analogy I always use. If, if your life is a house and, you're, and your heart is a house, and Jesus isn't some little shed that you get to build out back, and you get to visit there once on Sunday and then you get to leave, okay? If you want to follow Jesus, it's not praying prayer, it's not getting baptized, okay, even though those things are very important, but following Jesus means that you, you are giving up your life, okay, for Jesus. This is what it says in Matthew 16. This is, this is Jesus um, talking to his disciples. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. But whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. But what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? So here's my point. Jesus longs to have a relationship with each of us, okay? But if you're not willing to let him be the Lord of your life, not just the Savior because you want to go to heaven someday, but if you are not willing to let him be the Lord of your life, we cannot follow Jesus, okay? But in that, he also offers fullness of joy. It's like two sides, 
two sides to a coin, okay? On one hand, um, following Jesus is going to be like carrying a cross every single day. But on the other hand, he offers us rest, peace, and joy, and satisfaction, okay? So, if you still want to be a laborer, hopefully I haven't scared you too much, the Bible says that we are saved when we receive the free gift of God's love and grace through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And from that place, we go and we get to be a laborer and share this amazing gift um, with the world. So, it doesn't matter if you're a plumber, if you're a politician, if you're a pastor, maybe you're a stay-at-home mom, maybe you're retired, maybe you're in nursing or whatever it is. Okay, each of us is called a relationship, a daily continual relationship with Jesus, okay? Um, it would be foolish to me to say someday, someday when I get married and I never spend time with my wife, okay, and Pastor Phil never spent time with his wife, but said, hey, I have a great relationship with my wife. You call him a liar, right? Because, um, because to have a great relationship with anybody, you have to spend time with them. You have to uh, make an effort to be with them, okay? So, I know I'm kind of rambling. I just... I want you guys to leave here, if you guys are going to leave here with anything, it's that being a Christian is not something you just add to your life one day, hey, I, I prayed a prayer 15 years ago and I'm good. Okay, this is this is something that's a continual every day, picking up your cross and, and following Jesus. Okay, so I just quickly want to talk to a certain group in the room. Um, I think it's pretty funny because Jesus literally says, he stops, he's like, I see all these people, these people need me, and um, he tells his disciples, hey, pray that that that, um, that the Father would send our laborers into his harvest, okay? But immediately after that, Jesus calls his own disciples to go out into the harvest, okay? So um, it's easy for us to laugh and be like, hey, um, yeah, uh, Jesus, Jesus told his disciples to pray, um, but then he immediately sends them out. Uh, but how many times have we done this? How many times have we prayed that um, that some, someone would go um, save our grandma or um, save our son, whatever it is? Um, but in reality, God is calling you to be that laborer. God is calling you to be in that situation. God is calling you to be the light to that person. Um, and I just I just want you to think about it this way. Um, let's let's just say for a second that you had terminal cancer and you have one week to live, and um, and God miraculously heals you. Okay. You, you knew without a shadow of a doubt, all the doctors said, hey, you have a week to live, and God heals you, okay? Well, what is your natural response going to be? It's going to be to go out and say, hey, I was going to die, but I'm alive. I'm still alive because Jesus healed me, okay? So now apply this to our, our eternal state, okay? If you really believe that Jesus died for your sins and you're going to be in, in eternity and anyone who has not put their faith in Christ is going to be eternally separated from them, why would you not go out and share that with every single person you know? Okay? And I, I want to be very clear for a second that I am not the, the golden example of this, okay? I'm preaching to myself. I was just thinking last night when I was, when I was finishing up my message. I was like, Lord Jesus, how am I going to preach to a bunch of people when I am, I am the chief of sinners in this area? I, I often don't, don't find rest in Jesus. I often don't share that, share that joy with other people, but we get to grow together, right? So I just, I just, I just want to, again, emphasize, if, if you really believe that Jesus died for you and your sins are forgiven, and you, you've been spending eternity with your Creator, then that's something that you don't keep to yourself, but you share with, with everyone, right? Um, and you might say, well, why does Jesus even need us to be laborers if He's God, okay? And the truth is, He doesn't need us, okay? But because of some mystery, it brings Jesus a lot of joy to see us partner with him and obey him. Okay, and I just want you guys to think of it this way. Um, if you have kids, it might be, um, this might be a good analogy for you. Um, but I want you just to imagine for a second that you have, you have two children and um, you give one of them a gift. Okay, and you love both your, your children equally. You want to give both of them a gift. But what would bring you more joy if you gave them two separate gifts or if you gave them both one gift to share and, and enjoy together? Okay, and I and I would um, I would hope that um, that you would rather them enjoy something together because they get to have that relationship um, versus just giving them something separate and unique. And I think honestly, I think that's the way God sees it. I think that God wants us to be able to share this um, share this thing with each other, and I think that brings him a lot of joy. Um, so yes, he could do it all himself, but uh, what brings him most joy and most glory is watching us find joy in him and then sharing that with other people.
So let's just quickly return to the story. Um, so far, we know that um, amid Jesus' ministry, he stops. He acknowledges that we are helpless without him. Uh, we need a Savior, and that Savior is Jesus. And um, Jesus chooses not just to save people um, on his own, but, he, but he, he chooses to partner with us. So let's pick up the story really quick. Um, after a long, successful missionary journey, um, we can only imagine that the 12 disciples would have been tired, weary. They probably would have been excited, too, after all the miracles um, that, that the Holy Spirit worked through them. Okay? Um, but just think the amount of emotional, physical, and spiritual strength it would have taken to minister um, and just to be used in that, in that way, it would have been, it would have been a lot. Okay? Uh, each of us would be, would be burned, burned out. Um, and not only that, but uh, recently um, we know from the scripture that um, John the Baptist would have been beheaded around this time when they returned. Um, and just to put it into perspective, all of the twelve knew John the Baptist personally, um, and some would have even been his um, disciple at one point, and some would have been baptized by him. So it's safe to say that um, each of the disciples would have taken this news with great sadness. Um, but not only that, um, Jesus. When the disciples were away on their missionary journey, Jesus wasn't taking a vacation. Jesus wasn't taking a day off. Okay, Jesus was um, still ministering. Um, it says in, in uh, Matthew chapter 11 that Jesus continued his ministry, um, even in the absence of his closest friends. So when Jesus returns, Jesus is weird too. And John the Baptist was his cousin. He would have, he would have grown up with John, and they would have um, went to festivals together. Um, so uh, Jesus would have been great too. Um, so after all of this, after all the miracles, um, after um, all the deliverance, and um, even in the midst of uh, their mourning for John, um, this is what this is what it says. Um, the apostles returned to Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. And he said to them, "Come away by yourselves to a desolate place and rest a while, for many are, were coming and going, and they had no leisure even to eat." And they went away in the boat to a desolate place by themselves. So after all the amazing things that Jesus did through them. After all the things that they experienced, why was this Jesus' first response to, to the disciples? Come away and rest. What about all the other people that they, they still had to reach? And um, all, all across the Gospels, we see this response from Jesus. Um, no matter what the circumstance, no matter what the situation, Jesus would always withdraw and rest in a place um, of prayer, um, just spending time with his Father. So why was this such a staple in the life of Jesus? Why was this so important? Um, I think we would all agree that Jesus was the model of how we should live as people. Um, but how often we, do we take our own weirdness, our own sadness, and victory to God? Because this was Jesus' response to everything, to, to bring it to the Father in prayer and to rest in Him. So this leads me to a question. Um, are you worn out? Maybe you're mourning. Are you overwhelmed with life? Um, and really, there's only one answer to all of your problems. And Jesus talks about it in Matthew chapter 11. He says, Come to me, all who are labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lonely in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I know we talked about before about how following Jesus would be like the major cross, but now I want to emphasize that Jesus' burden is light. Okay? If you are carrying the weight of your sin, of your grief, of your guilt, of your weariness, the answer is to come to Jesus and you'll find rest. Okay, give it to Him um, and find rest. Okay, so I just quickly I want us to understand something. Um, just because rest is available doesn't mean that you're entering it. Okay, the thing about rest is it's not just going to happen. Um, ironically, we actually have to make an effort to enter that rest. Um, I just I just quickly want to put it into perspective um, for you all. So I want to tell you a little bit. About about my own testimony. Um, so I got saved in my sophomore year of high school. I grew up in the church. My, uh, both my parents were born again. Um, but I don't know. Um, I wasn't. Christianity was was a lifestyle. Christianity was an environment that I went to twice a week. I went to youth group on Wednesdays and on Sundays. Um, I went to church, but it was just a lifestyle. Like I, Jesus was just a name I said in my prayers. And nothing clicked. So when I went to public school for the first time. I was introduced to all this just evil and um, just everything that you can think of. Even even at fifth grade, it just it just hit me like a like a freight train. And immediately, I understood like if I want my friends at the school, I'm gonna have to fit in. I'm gonna have to conform. 
Um, so that's what my life was like all, all, um, all middle school um, and early high school until my sophomore year. And pretty much everything, everything in my life was being taken away. Um, my starting spot on the, on the football team, um, I was bench. Um, the girl I liked didn't like me back. Um, all my friends um, deserted me because of something that happened. So I was empty, I was, I, I was broken, and I knew that even the faith that I thought I had, um, it, was, it, was, it was non-existent. It was, it, was, it, it was a fantasy. I was deceived. I was deceiving myself. And uh, so I started to pay attention to church, and I started to talk to my pastor. And uh, one day, I just understood, man, Jesus, Jesus is the life that I need. So I put my faith in Jesus somewhere around my sophomore year, but um, I had no clue what it looked like to follow Jesus. I thought the following Jesus was like, hey, I'm going to read my Bible for like 15 minutes a day, and I'm going to pray, and I'm going to try to follow, follow um, the, the rules in the Bible the best that I can. Um, but it wasn't until one day, I used to, during, during COVID, I grew up um, in the country, like I said, um, I had this, I had this dog, and I used to go to his boat, and we would go on walks um, every single night um, out to, um, out in the pasture. I would just pray, I would just, um, I don't know, I was just trying to follow Jesus, and uh, one night, um, something just clicked. I realized that Christianity is not about me following the rules, it's about a living relationship that I had, and from that place, I get to obey. Um, and I just, um, the, the reason that this is important is I was putting so much pressure on myself to follow the rules, to follow what the Bible said, to pray enough, that I was completely joyless. I was completely restless. Um, I was, I always had this, like, um, something hanging over my head, like, John, you're not doing enough, you're not praying enough, all this stuff. And when I realized that Christianity is actually about a relationship, it was like I had this peace deep inside of me that I didn't have to perform to be loved. I didn't have to be good enough to be loved by Jesus because I was already loved. I was already um, considered enough in his eyes for him to die for me. Um, and I think that making Jesus a priority in our life can be difficult because we all have things going on. But I promise you that when you make Jesus your highest priority, you will find rest in him. And you will be equipped to be a faithful laborer in the harvest of God. So how do we rest in him? Um, we must pursue and love you pursue a friend, okay? Um, just think of anyone in your life that you enjoy spending time with. Um, and just think, what are what are those ways that, that, that you spend time with that person? Um, for me, I love to uh, play sports with my brother. Um, I love to do pretty much anything with, with my brother. He's one of my best friends, but um, I have a relationship with him because I spend time with him, okay? So pursue Jesus like you pursue a friend. Spend time reading the Bible, because that's that's his word to us. Spend time talking to him, bringing to him your anxieties, um, your your grief, whatever that is. Um, and just uh, spend time in fellowship, in Christian fellowship, and just pour out your heart to him and uh, depend on him. So as we rest in him, uh, Jesus promises to work everything for our good and his glory. Um, so immediately after, Jesus um, takes the disciples and rested in a desolate place. Immediately after that, Jesus went out and fed the 5,000. And um, how could Jesus, after being so weary and so sad, and the disciples, after doing all these miracles and being so weary, go out and then do something incredible? Um, the disciples would have been instrumental in, in, in the miracle of feeding the 5,000. They would have handed out um, baskets of food. And just, just imagine that you're weary when your best friend had just died and you got to go hang out food to 5,000 people, okay, with just 12 of you. So, how was Jesus able to do that? How were the disciples able to do that? And the answer is, they rested in the power the Holy Spirit has when we rest in Him. And when we, when we choose to lay down the weight of the world, and to sweeten the rest. So often we find ourselves overwhelmed with life, uh, but when we really think about all the people, excuse me, when, when we really think about all the people that need Jesus and all the things that we could be doing for Jesus, it's overwhelming, okay? But, um, the truth is, there will be always, um, there's always something more for us to do. There's something, um, there's someone else to talk to. There's something else to complete. But Jesus isn't calling us to do everything. He's just calling us to do what he has for each and every one of us. And I won't be able to tell you what that balance is. Um, but regardless, uh, we need to be able to lay down the worries and the cares of his life and simply ask Jesus, what is it you have me to do? How can I rest um, in your arms? And um, how can I follow you faithfully? So, um, as we wrap up, uh, I want you guys all to bow your heads um, really quickly. 
And um, just, just take a moment to examine yourself um, in, in light of everything um, that I said. Um, just whatever you can remember um, through my flawed speaking, just um, what are some things that maybe the Holy Spirit can make you want? Um, maybe maybe you are a Christian, but you're, you're not a laborer. Um, maybe you know you're part of the crowd that's just following Jesus because you want things from him. Um, whatever that is, just take a moment to examine yourself and um, and I want to just pray for you guys. Um, but really quick, as you guys are thinking, uh, I want to read to you guys the devotional from this morning. Um, I, I read this devotional by my pastor. It's called One Thing. And it's all about just um, seeking Jesus and encountering him. And um, the, the devotional for this morning, um, April 23rd, is uh, called Living from God's Presence. And I just want to read a little bit from you. But this is, this is the verse that he uses. There remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For anyone who enters God's rest also rests from his own works, just as God did from his. Let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest. So um, I just I just took that as directly from God this morning, that, that this was a word that someone in this room needed to hear. Um, so please, everyone, um, bow your heads really quick, close your eyes. Um, I'm going to pray um, as we conclude. So Lord Jesus, thank you so much. Uh, for this morning, uh, thank you for all your blessings that you pour out upon us. And um, Lord, we just want to um, lift up to you um, each person in this room. Uh, we each, each have our own junk going on. Um, each of us are weary and um, sad, maybe, whatever that is, Lord Jesus. Would you just um, meet each person here? Um, and Lord, uh, would you open the eyes of anyone in this room that has not put their faith in Christ yet? And um, maybe would you expose um, any any false sense of security that they have that if they prayed a prayer or if they, they did something that they're good, Lord, would you just expose um, the fact that they actually need a relationship with you, an ongoing living relationship? Um, and Lord, whatever whatever you do, uh, each and every single one of us, the Lord, we're going to give you um, the glory for it. Um, we pray in your name. Amen. Thank you, church. Um, I think, I think this is the last thing we gotta do, so um, bless you, have a good day, you dismiss. Hey, thank you so much for listening to our podcast today. If you would like to connect with me or Greencastle Church of the Nazarene, you can find us on Facebook at Greencastle Nazarene and also on our website, www.greencastlenazarene.com. May you have a blessed and wonderful day in the Lord.